A flight is in trouble when both engines fail on its approach to London Heathrow. Mayday, mayday, speed burn, speed burn. Time flies, time flies. Sparks fly as an A380 Super Jumbo's wheels explode on landing. We're on fire. And passengers brace for impact on a plane whose landing gear is stuck at an impossible angle. I thought I was about to see what it was like to die. Shows to my mom, family, drug when I love them. Aircraft manufacturers continue to invent new ways to carry more passengers further, faster, and cheaper than ever before. But when plane technology is pushed to the limit, things can go horribly wrong. While plane crashes remain very rare, in the world's crowded skies, we now know there are hundreds of near misses. More of us are flying than ever before, and we're carrying our cameras and phones. Even though flying has never been safer, more and more events are being caught on camera, showing what happens when things go wrong. From these amazing first-hand experiences, we can get a glimpse of where we're pushing the limit. September 21st, 2005. A JetBlue Airbus A320 is getting ready to fly to New York. The aircraft has a special feature for passengers. They can watch live TV on the in-flight entertainment system. One of them, Dave Reinitz, films the journey. Got on the plane, had, uh, had a nice aisle seat, and really just kind of stowed my stuff and sat down and just wanted to go to sleep and arrive in New York. Immediately after takeoff, the flight crew realizes that something is very wrong. Declare the emergency. Gear is uh, not retracting. We have 145 on board. Ashley Walker is on board when the pilot makes the terrifying announcement telling passengers what's going on. When I heard him announce that, it was kind of like hearing, you might die in a few hours. It was like being kind of like locked in a room with a bunch of strangers waiting to die. The captain has no idea why his landing gear won't retract. He decides to divert the plane to Long Beach to work out what the problem is. They really didn't know what was going on. They had to use eyes on the ground, specifically air traffic controllers at another airport. They flew by the control tower. The tower and a local news helicopter that's broadcasting live identify the problem. And it's even worse than the pilot fears. We're flying along and we're waiting for some more information about what's happening. And all of a sudden I look in the television in front of me and there's coverage of a plane. And that plane's landing gear is completely twisted. And it takes me a minute to realize that that's the plane that we're on. The landing gear isn't just stuck in the down position, it's turned 90 degrees. And now everyone on board knows it. It wasn't until we started watching ourselves on TV that I think the fear kind of escalated, which for me at least made it all the more horrifying. It's me, I'm watching the plane on the TV we're having landing gear problems with it. It's absolutely surreal to be watching the story of the plane that you're in. It was very scary. Am I going to die? The pilot, Captain Scott Burke, decides to head for Los Angeles International Airport since it has a long runway and first class emergency services. Before he can put the plane down, the pilot has to burn off as much fuel as he can to land at a lighter weight. This will take several hours. Now, this particular airplane didn't have one of those systems where you can dump fuel off, so they actually had to fly around and burn the fuel off over time. The passengers can do nothing but endure a growing sense of dread. It was definitely like a countdown to maybe dying and giving, giving people so much time to actually think about what that might be like. Not good feelings in those two hours. Just uh, thought I'd leave you a message just in case. It's just I love you. But if anything happens, take care of everything. It's my mom, family, everyone I love. The 
lives of the passengers on board depend on the ability of the pilots. Now that the excess fuel has all been burned off, they're nearly ready to attempt the landing. They radio other pilots for advice. How are you doing? I've, I've had better days. How are you? Well, you don't want to try and hold the nose super high because your airspeed will bleed off and then the nose will come slamming down. And instead of letting the nose down, just keep holding it. Hold it. So I'll hold it up, but uh, before I lose the authority, I'm going to try and set it down. The pilots are going to try to do a kind of wheelie down the runway, keeping the nose wheel off the ground for as long as possible. They need to shift the weight from the crippled wheels. It wasn't like, this row, get up and move to the back of the plane. It was like, everybody get to the back of the plane right now. Uh, see, another data point is the uh, bus will be moving bags aft as well. We are uh, moving uh, bags uh, aft, and uh, I, I believe I'm going to wind up with the first three rows of the aircraft uh, completely empty. Very good, Doug. Do you want to trade places? Having watched their life-threatening situation on national television for hours, now the passengers will face the end game flying blind. The onboard TVs are shut off as the plane begins to make its final approach. We're down to uh, Bingo Fuel now at this time, Scott. I see 10,000 showing up here on the upper E camp. Um, I think it's uh, time uh, for execution. Do you concur? It's now or never. Honestly, when the captain said, prepare for landing, it was just waterworks. Place your feet and firmly on the floor. I was sobbing hysterically, and I wasn't the only one, so it's okay. Of course, your wrist on the seat back in front of you. Lean forward and place your forehead on your wrist. Uh, I'm sure you'll uh, be a hero here. Well, uh, that's not the point. Uh, I just uh, want to make sure that everyone gets off the airplane, okay? I'll say a little prayer as this pilot touches down. And then that nose gear will hit and we'll see what happens. And then, then we touched down, you could feel it when it started. And then when the front went down, you could feel it was shaking. It was shaking. Amazing sight. And then all of a sudden the cabin filled with the smell of burning rubber. It was just really intense. You know what, folks? I think he's done it. Very nice landing. He did it. Then it just stopped. Everything just stopped. And we were there. And then there was just a beat of silence. Was Fine. that good or what? And then all of a sudden, the whole cabin just erupted with, yay! Right on! When we all realized that we had landed and we were safe and we were back on the ground where human beings belong. Everyone getting off the plane turned around to get a glimpse of this wheel that had caused us so much uh, stress for hours. The force of the landing ripped the tires apart and wore the wheels down to their core. Amazingly, no one was injured. But once all the passengers were safely off the plane, investigators swooped in to find out exactly what had gone wrong. They immediately focused on the front landing gear. Hidden within it is a set of anti-rotation lugs that ensure the wheel assembly remains in the correct forward-facing position when it extends. On JetBlue 292, the lugs were broken along cracks in the metal, so the wheel was able to become twisted at a right angle to the runway. 
the landing gear has no mechanism to return the wheel to its correct position. It was stuck, and there was nothing anyone on board the flight could have done about it. The accident report recommended changes to the automated systems and maintenance testing, either of which might have caused the damage. Later, Airbus also redesigned the affected part of the landing gear and retrofitted all A320s. Because the crew acted in an intelligent manner, this was much less serious than it could have been. They were very aware of exactly what kind of problem they had. They had ample opportunity to get insight from the ground and from each other. They had ample time to prepare, prepare the airplane. And they had the luxury of choosing from a number of excellent airports in the Southern California area. JetBlue 292 is a chilling lesson for an aviation industry where aircraft are only getting more complex. Even a small, faulty piece of equipment that has never failed before can potentially cause a disaster. But when a unique set of circumstances exposes an unforeseen design flaw, the pilots are on their own. In London, a British Airways 777 suffers a sudden engine failure just seconds before landing. January 17, 2008. British Airways Flight 38, a Boeing 777, is approaching Heathrow after an overnight flight from Beijing. It's just one minute away from landing. Sculptor Paul Stafford is returning home from a business trip. It's the end of a quite a long, boring flight. We've been flying for just over 11 hours from Beijing. I've been doing work for the university interviewing postgraduate students. It's all very ordinary. But it's soon going to be very unordinary. Just 60 seconds from landing, the engines suddenly fail. Captain Ian Hollingworth takes us through the events in a simulator. They're now on the final stages of the approach, just looking forward to putting it on the aeroplane on the ground. So they're making sure that all the checks are complete. The captain certainly is making sure that everything's fine. The undercarriage down, final flap selected, the landing checks complete. They've been given landing clearance. It's only in the last 50 seconds or so that things start to go badly awry for this crew. At 750 feet, both engines suddenly lose power. The captain will look across at the engine instrumentation. There's not enough power coming from those engines. They're getting very low. They're getting very low on speed as well. At 600 feet, both engines fail. The aircraft's speed drops dangerously low. The pilots have less than 30 seconds to react. The captain looks around to see what on earth is going on. The fuel system's in the correct position. The fuel control switch is in the right place. Everything looks normal. But it's not. The pilot is fast losing any ability to control the plane. It begins to fall through the sky, lifting the nose. He has moments to make a life or death decision. As the nose begins to rise and the speed begins to drop right off, it becomes apparent that they're not gonna be able to make the runway. 10 seconds before landing. Even if they can't make the runway, they have to get over the boundary fence. The captain needs to extend his glide as much as he can. He raises the flaps, streamlining the wings. The captain brings the flap up to 25. The co-pilot lowers the nose. Mayday, mayday, mayday. It's only three seconds to impact. Captain Burkhill's been so busy, it's his first chance to warn air traffic control. Mayday, mayday, speedbird, speedbird. Nine five, nine five. In the heat of the moment, Captain Burkhill has announced the call sign of his next flight. Taxi driver John Rowland is arriving at Heathrow for a pickup. The plane narrowly misses him. As I drove the, the, the taxi around the perimeter road, which you do every day, going towards Terminal 4, there was a shadow, a shadow cast across the vehicle on the, on the road. Um, you knew something that was very large above you because it was an enormous shadow. And it wasn't until I looked out the window to, to see what it was, um, and I saw the plane coming in very, very low. It could have only been eight to 10 foot above my vehicle and literally just about missing the perimeter fence. Pushes forward on the control column to try to recover from an impending stall. Aeroplane crashes. 
Flight BA-38 slams down just short of the runway. The oxygen masks come down in front of me, all over the plane in front of me. The, the overhead lockers open, everyone's belongings start to fly out. And the plane's hurting forward, and I'm hitting my head on the front of the seat, and my foot's hit, the, hit the, the back of the seat, and I'm being thrown around, and I've no idea what's going on. And it seems to last maybe eight, nine, ten seconds, then we shut it to a halt. Mr. Captain. Evacuate. Well, they land the aeroplane just over the threshold of uh, runway 27 left, away from any, uh, any of the built-up areas, and they survive. They survive because they did an absolutely brilliant job. It was thanks to the pilot's quick thinking that he managed to give the plane a critical extra 164 feet of glide path. As emergency services arrive, passengers bail out of the stricken plane one of the rescuers films the aftermath. And it's all very calm, it's curious. I walk away from the aeroplane, maybe 100 yards, 120 yards, and I turn around and I see this great big modern aeroplane, this 777, smashed to pieces on the floor. 47 people were injured, but thanks to the crew's fast maneuvering, there were no fatalities. There are over 1,000 777s in service. This is the first one in 18 years to be damaged beyond repair. This was uh, really the first hull loss of a 777 uh, from an in-flight event. Uh, so by definition, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be rare. There's one key clue. Both engines lost power almost simultaneously. So investigators turned to the fuel system. Once we started looking at the fuel system, a few things come to mind. First, of course, is fuel starvation. Did they run out of fuel? Clearly, no. There was plenty of fuel in the tanks. Was the fuel contaminated with some foreign substance, uh, whether you know, liquid, chemical, um, foreign solid objects in the fuel tanks? So we started looking for that. Heading west from Beijing, outside temperatures plummet to below minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Jet fuel doesn't freeze at these temperatures, but it contains a very small amount of something that does, water. So could water within the fuel have frozen and blocked the system? Investigators approached Element Materials Testing Facility in Florida to find the answer. Shortly after the accident, we were contacted by some of the authorities. They were interested in recreating the actual conditions that existed in the flow system of the aircraft. So scientists at the facility built a rig to simulate what happened inside the 777 fuel system. During the flight, the small amount of water that's naturally present in the fuel turns into ice, all of which is perfectly normal. These ice particles then attach to the walls of the pipes that carry fuel to the engines. As fuel passes through the pipes, bits of ice break away, but a filter prevents them from reaching the engine. Over here, we have our main fuel tank, which can condition 4,000 gallons of jet fuel down to minus 40. This chamber is using liquid nitrogen to cool the fuel up down to minus 40. In this area here, we have water injection system, which is, allows the water to go into the fuel. Over here, we have a visual indication that tells us the verification we have ice in the system. And then on to our test item, which in this case is a filter. The test rig allowed investigators to examine the fuel flow at every stage of BA-38's journey. Although the conditions were easy to simulate, the scenario that had occurred on the flight was so rare that reproducing what happened was virtually impossible. Since all other 777s remained in service, the pressure was on to find the problem. The experiment was repeated time and time again over a period of two years until finally the answer emerged. As the flight steadily crossed Northern Asia, its engine's fuel demand was low. In these conditions, instead of breaking away in small quantities, the ice collected in the fuel system. And for some reason, on this flight, the ice had a unique sticky consistency, meaning it built up into larger pieces. The ice turns into this sticky sludge that sticks to any surface and can collect into bigger chunks of ice, which can then break off as icebergs that sail through the system. 
And when they got to Heathrow and throttled up the engines, the fuel dislodged these bigger chunks of sticky ice, which hit the filter. It's meant to melt the ice, but was unable to cope, so instead became blocked. You can see as he's taking the filter off, there's a large amount of ice crystals that are built up on the exterior of the filter, enough so to clog up the filter, causing the engine shutdown. Scientists discovered that the sticky ice was not caused by the cold temperatures experienced over Siberia, but by a one in a million set of conditions within the fuel pipes. It takes a remarkable uh, combination of temperatures at just the right time, fuel flows at just the right time to have this phenomenon happen. It's amazing that just this 25 milliliters of water is enough to cause a blockage in the fuel system, causing the engines to shut down and cause a crash. Despite the incredibly rare nature of the incident at Heathrow, Rolls-Royce took action to redesign the filter. In the old design, raised grooves could trap the ice, so they flattened the face of the filter, ensuring the ice would directly contact the hot metal and melt. This was a fault that took millions of flying hours to emerge. It was lucky that when it did, no one died. Everyone involved looked back and realized that wasn't something that was predicted. It was a condition that nobody knew, but now we realize happens and could happen in many long haul large aircraft. Even after hundreds of thousands of flights, tried and tested aircraft designs that are considered to be the most reliable can still deliver nasty surprises. But brand new state-of-the-art jets are no better. In 2013, smoking batteries on two Dreamliners leave the world's newest plane grounded. This was a catastrophic failure. 2004, as fuel prices soar and the number of passengers traveling by air steadily rises, Boeing launches the Dreamliner project to create the airliner of the future. Boeing has set out to, to make a much, um, much lighter, more efficient um, aircraft. Fuel is now easily a third of, of an airline's costs. So aircraft have to be more fuel efficient these days to get the costs down of, of providing airline service. Seven years and $32 billion later, it takes to the skies. The 787 Dreamliner is revolutionary as in terms of technology. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner is hailed as the future of air travel. It's designed to carry more people further, to more destinations, and critically, on 20% less fuel than its predecessor. Above all, this plane is lightweight. Every pound saved on the plane means another pound of passengers. One of its secrets is battery power. Electric power, as opposed to pneumatic power, is one of the key technologies in, in building these new generation of more efficient aircraft. Lithium-ion batteries are part of that, and that it was an essential part of the Boeing design. Lithium-ion batteries, like the ones used in cell phones and laptops. There are two big batteries on board, one behind the wings and the other under the cockpit, and they are half the weight of traditional batteries, the ideal component for an efficiency-minded manufacturer. What the batteries helped Boeing do was run more systems on electricity, cutting fuel consumption by 20%. Just one Dreamliner battery can produce enough energy to light a street of homes. January 16th, 2013, Japan. A Dreamliner carrying 169 passengers and eight crew is heading for Tokyo. It's one of 50 that are already flying. In the air, pilots detect an acrid smell in the cockpit. Instruments indicate systems errors. Fearing the worst, they make an immediate emergency landing. The revolutionary lithium-ion batteries, used to help power the plane when on the ground, have overheated. 
Many people have been killed by smoke and fumes on an aircraft when they've never seen flames. This was an unbelievably close call. They're unbelievably fortunate that no one was hurt or killed. Disturbingly enough, this isn't an isolated event. One week earlier, another shiny new Dreamliner lands at Boston's Logan Airport. 20 minutes later, a cleaner smells smoke near a machine at the back of the plane. Then a mechanic investigating the electronics bay sees smoke and fire. Again, lithium ion batteries are to blame. The charred remains clear evidence that something has gone drastically wrong. We investigated the event that occurred in Boston on JAL in January of 2013 because we were concerned. Fire safety is one of our top 10 issues on our most wanted list, and we wanted to understand really the cause of the battery fire. Up in the air at 30,000 feet in a confined space, smoke can be fatal. What we saw is in the design and testing of the 787 lithium ion battery was that they estimated that we would not see a smoke event but once in every 10 million flight hours. What we saw this, this year were two events on two separate aircraft less than two weeks apart. The smoke from the lithium ion batteries was considered such a serious danger that the 50 Dreamliners in service were grounded that same day, just 15 months after its launch. The issue was now costing Boeing $43 million a week. Grounding a, a whole fleet of airplanes, uh, whether it's a brand new fleet or a mature fleet, it, it's always a big deal uh, because there are so many different entities that are involved. It's uh, the manufacturers are involved, the authorities are involved, the airlines are involved, and passengers are involved. So it's not something that's, that's done lightly. It's generally rare for lithium ion batteries to spontaneously combust, but we've seen it happen, even in items we use every day. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Fortunately, this laptop was in the terminal at LAX and not on board an aircraft when it did this. Oh my and these batteries are 85 times less powerful than those on the Dreamliner. Boeing stresses that their lithium-ion batteries are significantly different from those used in laptops, and that the batteries were thoroughly tested to ensure they were robust, and that any failure would not result in danger to the plane. When a lithium-ion battery overheats, it begins a process known as thermal runaway. The hotter the battery gets, the more energy it produces. Unless the heat can escape, this cycle will continue until the battery ignites. The Dreamliner incidents made the FAA suspect the batteries on board were overheating and at risk of catching fire, so they grounded the entire fleet. Thermal runaway has one terrifying implication. At Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts, Scientists are keen to see just how volatile lithium-ion batteries can be. Each Dreamliner battery is roughly twice the size of a car battery and produces 60 times the power of the ones they're using here. To understand what happens when the battery catches fire, scientists are going to simulate one of the five cells combusting and observe the results for the whole battery. The batteries are placed in a secure container and one of the cells is set alight. As the temperature within the cell rises up to 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, it sparks a thermal runaway. Within seconds, it has generated enough heat to ignite the other four. The cells continue to produce heat, getting hotter and hotter, until suddenly the battery explodes, sending out a shower of shrapnel across the lab. The smoking battery made the FAA fear this could happen on the Dreamliner. A potentially volatile mix of chemicals prone to catching fire and giving off poisonous fumes. After more than 12 weeks of tests, Boeing announced, it is possible we will never know the root cause. It is not uncommon not to have found the single root cause, so industry best practice 
is to look at all the potential causes and address all of them. But Boeing didn't abandon lithium ion. Under direct FAA supervision, they installed an improved battery design to help prevent thermal runaway. And they have also designed an additional casing for the battery unit. Boeing says this housing eliminates any possibility of fire as it creates an oxygen-starved environment. And should a fire occur, it will vent any smoke and flames outside of the aircraft. On April 27, 2013, the Dreamliner started flying again, new lithium batteries and all. By one estimate, grounding their planes cost Boeing $600 million. The engineers behind the Dreamliner knew that the tried and tested lithium ion battery was a risky technology. It was Boeing's language itself in their own certification papers that said this runaway thermal event on a battery was a catastrophic failure. Their own language says that this was about the worst thing that could happen to this battery. So why was Boeing allowed to put the original batteries on their new aircraft? And does this tell us something about the way modern airliners are designed and built? When airliner is certified as safe, is the government allows the manufacturer to design the tests and then say when they've met them. And then the government signs off on the certification. So it's kind of a do-it-yourself project. The manufacturer or the assembler says what they're going to do to prove it's safe and then tells the government when they've done it. And the FAA then signs off on the certification. The FAA stresses that authority to carry out tests is only granted to organizations with demonstrated qualifications and technical expertise, and that the agency rigorously supervises the entire process and examines the test data directly. This relationship between the FAA and the aircraft manufacturers has served the aviation industry well for decades. But something crucial has changed in the last 10 years. The way we build aircraft now is on a, you know, a very different uh, scale than what we did in years past. In years past, if you went to the, you know, the Douglas Aircraft Plant, from A to Z, it was they did a lot of their own manufacturing. And now it's a global outsourcing project. So on a modern Dreamliner, the wing flaps are Australian, the nose is American, the fuselage is Italian, the landing gear is made in the UK, and the cabin lights are German. The Dreamliner has more than two million parts made by hundreds of suppliers spread across the world. This network of manufacturers and suppliers means that quality control is more complex. We may never know what caused the Dreamliner battery problem, but it was caught before anyone was seriously hurt, and Boeing has found a fix for the issue. Aircraft design is driven by the commercial need to produce efficient, profitable planes. But the near misses in Boston and Japan are a harsh reminder of the dangers of pushing the bounds of technology. But it's not the only example. When rival manufacturer Airbus brought out its own next generation plane, the A380 Super Jumbo, it almost immediately experienced a near miss of its own. Oh my God. We're on fire. In 2007, Airbus launched its vision of the future of aviation. It's the largest passenger jet in the world, the A380. The Super Jumbo can carry up to 853 passengers, 40% more than its nearest rival, making it more cost-effective than any other airliner. For the first three years in the air, it boasts impressive reviews until March 2010, Sydney. Qantas Flight 32, an A380, arrives from London via Singapore. As it comes into land, a passenger on board films the seat back screen. As she watches, flames lick out from under the wing. Oh my God. Fire. We're on fire. The wheels are on fire. <laughs> the wheels are on fire. The plane comes to a halt on the runway, 
it becomes clear that two of the aircraft's 22 tires have exploded on touchdown. Tire burst can be very dramatic. It will cause a lot of concern and fear in fearful flyers. Modern jet airliners uh, have got multiple tires, so you can lose tires and still be able to land safely. It's only a quick fix, and then back into the air. Just seven months later, another super jumbo flying the very same route has its closest brush with disaster. November 2010. This time, Qantas Flight 32 has just taken off from Singapore. Captain Richard de Crepigny is headed for his home airport of Sydney. It was just like every other flight. Everything was normal. But just four minutes into the flight, a loud noise rumbles throughout the cabin. We were climbing over the island of Bataan, and we had passed about 7,400 feet when there were two loud noises. It was like boom. Out of the blue, one of the A380's four engines has exploded. There was a, there was a bang, a bit like a, a car backfiring. Um, didn't think much to it at that point. You knew it shouldn't have been happening. I looked over at Bill, and within about 30 seconds, there was another bang. And there was a bit of a judder. One of the passengers films the hole that has been punched in the wing. I do apologize. I'm sure you're aware we have a technical issue with uh, our number two engine. Uh, we have dealt with the situ uh, situation at the moment. The aircraft is secure at this stage. We're going to have to hold for some time whilst we do uh, lighten our load by uh, dumping some fuel and a number of checklists we have to perform. could see the hole in the wing. They could see the smoke from the engine, the fire as well. Right now, Captain de Crepigny has no idea what caused the bang, but he knows he's in trouble. The plane is warning him that there's a problem with almost every major system on board. We had engine, and then we had fuel system and flight controls and electrics, hydraulics, pneumatics, landing gear, brakes, auto thrust. The airplane got confused. It saw several top-level priority emergency conditions that it needed to display simultaneously that it couldn't. So it became it somewhat in conflict with itself, which provided uh, a confusing amount of information to the pilots. On Batam Island, Indonesia, pieces of the aircraft start falling out of the sky. There were actually reports that the airplane had crashed when, in fact, it was still in the air. Captain de Crepigny begins a return journey directly to Singapore. They didn't know how much more damage uh, had been done by the, the engine failure and the, the uncontained parts. They knew that the airplane uh, had been badly damaged, so they made what I think is a good decision to go ahead and land the airplane. To land safely, he should dump fuel, but some of the fuel systems are damaged, meaning he can't. He'll have to land 50 tons heavier than the safe recommended weight. And after touchdown, he knows crucial systems he needs to help him to stop the plane have failed. They didn't have full flaps, they didn't have full brakes, they didn't have uh, full reverse thrust, if any. Um, some of the, the wing spoilers were not going to be operative. So all of these add additional distance on the runway. Normally, the onboard computer calculates how much tarmac they need. But it isn't designed to deal with the cascade of failures that's occurring. With so much damage, the plane's brain has gone into meltdown. The co-pilot calculates that on a massive 4,400-yard runway, the largest passenger jet in the world will only have a tiny margin for error, just 100 yards to spare. My whole concentration was the runway and the approach to the runway and the speed, and I had to keep that speed locked. As the A380 lands in Singapore, passengers pray. I've never been more terrified in my life. The drama isn't over yet. The plane is coming in 35 knots faster than usual. The braking system heats up to over 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. 
One engine won't shut down, and with a major fuel leak, everyone on board is terrified of the fire risk. At about 200 metres from the end, I eased the brakes right off to roll to 100 metres from the end because I wanted to get to those fire crews as quickly as possible. A Qantas A380 has made an emergency landing at Changi Airport in Singapore. Fire crews immediately drench the aircraft in fire retardant foam. Well, I can remember seeing a, a big hole, it looking very black, but you could actually see inside the engine, the complete casing of the engine was gone. When we looked back, we, we would realise how lucky we were for what we'd seen. I think that is the point where you thought, wow, we are very lucky. Investigators head straight for the shattered engine, made for Airbus by Rolls-Royce. What they found was even more deadly than they expected. Something had caused a turbine disc at the back of the engine to explode, disintegrating into at least three pieces of killer shrapnel. One projectile shot through the wing, rupturing two of the fuel tanks, another ripped through the leading edge of the wing, and a third tore through the underbelly of the plane, severing the aircraft's wiring and crippling its computer systems. Fortunately, the metal shards narrowly missed the passenger cabin. The fact that the three larger pieces uh, coming out of the Qantas 32 engine uh, didn't strike the fuselage is literally, quite literally, random luck. Wichita State University is renowned for its aerospace engineering program. Here, aviation engineers can demonstrate just how much damage a single exploding shard of turbine disc can cause. Underneath this wooden block, we have a composite piece similar to this that represents the uh, uh, A380 uh, fuselage material. At the end, we have this really sharp knife edge representing the sharp edges of the pieces that escape the engine. A hundred pound weight has been added to simulate the force of the explosion. But in the lab, we can't get close to the real power. The amount of energy released by the turbine failure was approximately a hundred times more than the energy that's going to be applied here. Three, two, one, go! Planes are designed to be as light as possible. They're not made to withstand metal objects being propelled at tremendous speeds. So imagine what you just saw and multiply that by 100 times. So it's like a bullet going through the fuselage. And uh, if there's a passenger on its way, uh, the fatality is uh, inevitable. So what caused the uncontained engine failure? Investigators look for clues among the debris on Batam Island and find evidence of an oil leak. In the case of Qantas 32, the discoloration on some of the metal indicated uh, that they needed to look very carefully at the oil supply system. They quickly discovered that the cause was an oil pipe. The hole through the pipe was drilled inaccurately. Instead of the hole being straight down the center, it was off to one side, which caused it to split. This pipe fed lubricating oil into the engine's bearings. But the crack allowed oil to escape into the hottest part of the engine and sparked a fire. That fire softened the fixings on one of the turbine discs, which spun out of control and exploded. Rolls-Royce took immediate action to rectify the problem and to replace the pipe on all other A380s carrying their engines. Despite the damage, this wasn't the end of the line for this Qantas plane. After a hefty repair bill of nearly $150 million, that same plane started flying again. So the industry's two most recent new aircraft have both suffered serious technical failures. It proves that despite hundreds of hours of pre-flight testing and careful certification, it is impossible to foresee everything that could go wrong. Failure is inherent in everything we do. And, and to think that uh, there'll never be failures in our industry is just not possible. For two reasons. One is, is technology is always going to uh, be defined by a state of the art. And the second is that there's always going to be economics involved. 
All these incidents have something in common. In a complex machine, operating for millions of hours, carrying billions of passengers every year, there will always be technical unknowns. Every close call, every near miss, is an accident that didn't happen and an opportunity for us to prevent the next one. Flying today is in many ways safer than ever. But however well-designed airplanes are, incidents can happen. Whether they occur in the first few weeks or after 20 years in the air, any aircraft can be subject to a technological failure. There are always going to be things that come up. It's how we react and respond to those that make the aviation system safe.